Brethren in Christ, love day to Jesus Christus and Secula. This is Timothy Flanders at the Meaning of Catholic. The doctor is in. That's right. Dr. Edmund Maza is with us once again. Dr. Maza, how you doing? Too blessed to be stressed, brother. Yes, indeed. Me as well. Too blessed, indeed. So, Dr. Maza, we've got, so first of all, edmundmaza.com is the uh, place to go for your, your courses. Uh, you want to update anybody on, on your current offerings, Dr. Maza, before we get into our topic? Thank you, Timothy. Yeah, well, to, uh, last night was our first world history class, and the night before that was our first church history class. So it's not too late to join. Uh, and, you know, if, if, if what we do today whets your appetite, uh, we're going to go into a lot of the backstory of how we got to this point. Uh, over, we're going to look at the last 55 years uh, of, of world history and the last 55 years of church history. We're running a special right now. If you sign up for both classes, uh, it's heavily discounted. So go to edmundmaza.com, and we'd love to have you. Fantastic. All right. So this show is uh, we're going to get release this to the public in, in a little a few days or a week or something like that, whatever works with your discount here, Dr. Mazza. But um, this is so we're just going to release this because we want this information to be, get out there. Yeah. Um, but you have a chance to give your live questions um, and answer any particular questions for Dr. Matza. Um, But the patron only stream is where we cover all the really controversial topics. So we have a, a 12 part series um, covering Jews and Judaism and Israel. We actually recommended Dr. Matza's book. He has a book on Jews. It's very good. Um, and we cover all the things that uh, get censored from YouTube on the patron only show. So here's the, the Ukraine show. Um, so this is going to be three different views, uh, NATO, Russia, and Fatima. So where would you like to start, Dr. Masa? Do you want to start with NATO? That's probably the most yeah. familiar to everybody. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, let's start with NATO. And, and actually it's even more in depth than that. It's, it's sort of a, you know, trads and faithful Catholics are kind of divided on this issue. Uh, so let's, let's go with the, uh, Contra, uh, Russia view on this and the backstory to that uh and again there's a lot more on this in my course uh, i don't know how many people are familiar with the former kgb agent anatoly golitsyn he defected to the united states in 1961 and he became friends with the head of the cia uh, the famous james angleton and uh, golitsyn exposed uh communist moles in Western intelligence. So he did the world a big favor. You might have heard of Kim Philby, who was the head of MI5 in Britain, basically the equivalent of our CIA. Turned out that guy was a double agent. Um, but uh, in later years, Galitsyn was kind of viewed as not serious by certain people, like um, the w William F. Buckley, kind of looked down his nose at Galitsyn. Uh, and conservatives like William F. Buckley, they looked down their noses at uh, perhaps folks have heard of the John Birch Society. Uh, the John Birch Society back, especially in the 70s, was warning people against the United Nations and against a fake split between China and the Soviet Union. See, back in the late 50s, early 60s, there was trouble between uh, the Soviet Union and China. And uh, according to Galitsyn and according to the John Birch folks, that was a deception, a strategic deception to get the United States to become more aligned with China, which is what Rick, uh, Richard Nixon did in the early 1970s. Um, but anyway, so... Uh, Galitsyn's ultimate point is that he published a book in 1982 uh, when Brezhnev had just died. And he predicted the fall of the Berlin Wall. He predicted the uh, Soviet Union uh, giving up its monopoly uh, on the Communist Party. I'll just read to you briefly uh, what he says here. He says, political liberalization and democratization 
would follow the general lines of the Czechoslovak rehearsal in 1968. Um, the liberalization would be spectacular and impressive. Formal pronouncements might be made about a reduction in the Communist Party's role. Its monopoly would be apparently curtailed. Um, uh, the KGB would be reformed. Dissidents at home would be amnestied. Those in exile abroad would be allowed to return, and some would take up positions of leadership in government. This was 10, he wrote this 10 years before the collapse of the Soviet Union and seven years before uh, the liberation of Eastern Europe in the fall of 1989. So Galitsyn, as a former KGB colonel, said this, when these things happen, it's not the end of the Soviet Union. It's a Trojan horse. It's to get us to give them tens of millions of dollars in aid to help their fledgling you know, democracy and to get us to cut our defense budget and to let our guard down. Um, and um, his view was echoed by a, a KGB uh, colonel who defected from Yugoslavia. Uh, I think his, his name is pronounced Pacepo. Perhaps you've heard of him. Um, and uh, he, he, um, he also echoed the idea that uh, all this liberalization in the Soviet Union was just a ruse. And to add to this, those people who believe this would say, look, after World War II, we had the Nuremberg process, right, to weed out all the Nazis, right, to make them answer for their crimes. But after the, you know, after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, and after the collapse of the Soviet Union in Christmas 1991, we never had a Nuremberg process in Russia. None of these guys ever answered for what they did. Um, and, and eventually a former KGB officer, Vladimir uh, um, Putin, is going to become the head. You know, it, I guess it was New Year's of the year 2000 that he became the head of the Soviet Union. Former KGB guys running, running the joint. And even all the political parties in Russia were, were at the time made up of former communists, you see? So um, now in line with this, uh, one of the th arguments against uh, Russia is that Russia is, has been acting like the Soviet Union by uh, giving aid to Venezuela, to Cuba, being allied with communist China, with North Hold Korea. Hold on just a minute. I got a, yeah. I got a kid. I got a kid. <laughs> Carry on for the audience. I'll be right back. Okay. So um, there's an there's a infamous uh, statement uh, that was made a number of years back by Vladimir Putin when he said that the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century was the collapse of the Soviet Union or maybe paraphrasing him, but it's actually a very close paraphrase. Uh, and that led a lot of people in the West to think that uh, Putin is interested in resurrecting uh, the Soviet Union. Now, the Soviet Union consisted of not only Russia, but also other republics, Kazakhstan, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, Ukraine, Georgia, Azerbaijan, well, all these different territories. And so when um, when Putin said, you know, the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century was the collapse of the Soviet Union, it reinforced this idea that he is just a, a, a KGB thug and uh, he wants to resurrect uh, the, the Soviet Union. And so um, uh, what happened in the late 1990s is that NATO began to, now, what is NATO? NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. NATO was uh, started after World War II to try to keep uh, Russia and communism at bay. Uh, during World War II, or, you know, uh, Russia liberated Eastern Europe from the Nazis, but then the Russians, the Soviets, occupied Poland, Czechoslovakia, Romania, Hungary, uh, all the territories of Yugoslavia, the former Yugoslavia, uh, even they occupied Austria 
and uh, East Germany. And so NATO was formed to counterbalance the Warsaw Pact, uh, these, these uh, formerly free countries that had become communist countries after World War II. Communism was imposed on them by the Soviet Union. And of course, St. John Paul II, um, he lived a, a good portion of his life under Soviet control of Poland, for example. Um, so NATO consisted of the United States, Great Britain, um, and eventually other countries as, as well, uh, uh, West Germany, uh, France, uh, Italy, uh, even Turkey, uh, I believe, uh, is part of NATO. So, um, and basically the United States, you know, these countries really didn't have to have their own defense budget because the United States paid for their defense. Uh, and um, so you've got the, uh, you had NATO, uh, you know, from like 1949 uh, to the present day. Uh, and then there was the, war, the Warsaw Pact from the 1950s until, uh, well, until 1991, let's say. And, um, uh, but what happened in the late 90s is that because of the collapse of the Soviet Union and because Russia was an economic basket case uh, in the 1990s under Boris Yeltsin, NATO began to accept other formerly Warsaw Pact countries into NATO. So Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania, Poland uh, became part of NATO. And uh, of course, the Russians viewed this as, uh, as a troubling development. Um, but as far as the West was concerned, as far as NATO was concerned, uh, they were ensuring that these countries would never again be gobbled up by, uh, by Russia. But uh, things took a, a turn in 2008. In April of 2008, there was a NATO summit in uh, Bucharest. I guess that's Romania. And at this summit in uh, April of 2008, NATO issued a statement essentially saying that we're looking forward to having Ukraine and uh, Georgia as full-fledged members of NATO. Um, and immediately the, the Russian government said that this is intolerable because uh, for those of you are, who are not familiar with Ukraine, we've, we've got the map up on the screen now, uh, or we, we just did. <laughs> oh, I got a better map coming. Oh, just okay. a minute. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, the, so the advance of NATO, um, so the bottom line with the fall of the Soviet Union is that all the same communists are still in power, um, mm -hmm. as you're saying, and then NATO has advanced east. Here's a map for everyone not familiar with Eastern Europe, um, and let's see here. Yes, so here's the advance of, of NATO eastward uh, from 1950 to 1989, and then these lighter blue those are the formerly Iron Curtain countries under Soviet uh, influence and, and domain prior to 1990. Now all these are, are joining NATO. Now, if yeah. you could point out to the folks exactly where Ukraine is there. So here's, the, here's it, Ukraine right here. It's the gray area right next to the blue areas. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you can see, well, you, uh, you, this is not a physical map, but if this was a physical map, you would see that the country of Ukraine is vast and it's flat. Uh, and that has made it a good launching post for armies to invade Russia. Because there's really no natural boundaries except for the Dnieper River to block an invading army. And uh, just for the folks who might not know uh, certain aspects of Western history, uh in the early 1800s, Napoleon and his armies invaded Russia. Uh, and then uh, in 1941, uh, Hitler and his armies invaded Russia. Uh, so there have been multiple uh, large scale invasions of Russia. And particularly, Hitler was interested in the, uh, the resources in Ukraine, uh, oil, etc. cetera. Um, so, uh, so, but anyway, for, we're. Um, uh, yeah, the, here we go. You can see how there's no mountains whatsoever. This is flat lands. And this is the breadbasket 
of the uh, of Russia, of the former Soviet Union. This is like Middle America. Uh, this is where they 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 grow the grain. Um, so uh, in April of 2008, uh, NATO stated rather explicitly that they were looking forward to admitting Ukraine and Georgia into their alliance. Um, but this would be the equivalent. Well, I guess we'll, I'll talk more about that when we get to the Russian perspective on things. Now, from the Western perspective or the contra Russian position, it would be a great thing if Ukraine became part of NATO because, um, you know, back in the 1930s, Joseph Stalin, as the dictator of the Soviet Union, he killed by starving them to death uh, at least five million Ukrainians and perhaps more than that. Uh, yeah, it's the called ho the Holodomir. Yes, exactly. I, critical thing to remember that's been lost by everybody. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, so um, it, it's 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 on the scale. Uh, of the of the Jewish Holocaust and 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 more generally the 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 whole Holocaust that uh, Hitler did against the other races uh, as well. So um, so you know the Ukrainians obviously have a long memory about this and would uh, many of them, uh, especially in Western Ukraine, would like to be independent uh, of Russia. Uh, and when the when the Soviet Union began to break up. Uh, Ukraine was the first republic to become independent on August 24th of 1991. So they've had about 30 years now of um, of, in, of you know official independence uh, from Russia. Although in, in many ways they are dependent on Russia economically, and um, we're going to talk more about this uh, in the course of the show today. But uh, Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, is actually the uh, this, this, the place where both the Ukrainian people and the Russian people were, it's the site where they used to be one people uh, in the, uh, they make their appearance on, on the scene of history in the ninth century in the 800s after Christ. Uh, and they are known as the Rus, the Kievan Rus. And at that time they were a single nation. And I've been studying Russia and Ukraine uh, since 1988, that's, you know, 30, uh, 32 years ago, 33 years ago, that was when they celebrated the 1000th anniversary of um, Christianity in Russia and Ukraine, because in the year 988, Prince Vladimir of Kiev uh, embraced Catholicism. People may not realize this, but this was before the break between Rome and Constantinople in 1054. So the, the first kings of Kiev were actually Catholic kings. Uh, and uh, there's even a, an old book uh, about that, uh, the relationship between the, the princes of Kiev and uh, the Roman papacy. But um, so uh, as far as the West and NATO were concerned, uh, they thought it would be a great thing to have uh, Ukraine and Georgia as part of NATO. And as, as I was saying also earlier, um, Russia is viewed as a threat uh, by America and its allies because they've got thousands of nuclear warheads pointed at American cities. I mean, this has been the case since the 1950s, you know, since the Cold War. You know, that, that did not go away when Russia stopped being communist and Russia stopped being the Soviet Union. Uh, so there's, you've got thousands of nuclear warheads pointed at our cities. And in addition to that, especially over the last 20, 25 years, uh, Russia has been very chummy with, uh, with, ch with communist China, having uh, military drills together and uh, giving aid and uh, having economic exchange. Uh, so Russia supports Iran. Russia supports Venezuela. Russia supports Cuba. So it Russia has been keeping up with its former clients from the time that it was the Soviet Union. And so um, I guess in a nut if you know in a, in a nutshell, that would be the Western view of the situation. Do you want to add anything there, Tim? Uh, sure. So um, uh, Phil is is bringing out um, 
the the assertion that Ukraine is a secular pro George Soros country, um, and this goes. Did you mention the 2014 color revolution slash civil war? No, we didn't get to that yet. Okay, okay. I, I don't know if you. I guess that would be getting into the Russian perspective, but we can. Um, so I, I mean, essentially, we have these different these Cold War tensions, as you pointed out very well. There's no Nuremberg trial. Uh, in Germany, the Allied powers took over and they had denazification. They were hunting down. They were it was actually went too far because it was going into a bunch of social engineering. But basically, Germany is now on its knees to the world and has been. And that's why we have a problem with the German schism, because they're just trying to keep up with the, their, the West and be more and more progressive. Whereas Russia has been given the freedom or, or independence or whatever, it you know, internally collapsed and whatnot. Look, but like you said, they've they've still been able to have the same people in power, still have the nuclear warheads. So we have this encroachment of NATO. Um, but with NATO encroaching on Russia, we have you you said the 2008 uh, when NATO wanted to bring Ukraine in to uh, NATO, and and Putin has been saying this is a big threat to him. I mean, I think that the I don't know if you put the mentioned this yet um but it's like the cuban missile crisis all over again except in reverse the right. the soviets had missiles in cuba uh which provoked a massive crisis um and russia is saying this is a crisis um because nato is getting closer and closer so i want to get into ukraine's government um I, I don't know where you want to go next with Russia because we want to address what Phil is saying. And I, it seems that that the main factor there is the 2014 events. Am I right? Yes. Um, so in, um, in 2014, actually in the fall of 2000, I think it was the fall of 2013. Um, there was negotiations between Ukraine uh, and the, uh, the EU and NATO about a, a package, uh, economic package, political package that would draw Ukraine into their, the sphere, the sphere of the EU, the sphere of NATO. And uh, Putin realizing that this was a, a threat to him or you know, from his perspective, that's, that was the situation. He uh, made a counter offer to the Ukrainian government. Now the Ukrainian government at that time, um, do you have the gentleman's name in front of you, um, Timothy? Oh, the president at the time? Yeah, um, Yukashenko, I think. Yeah, it, yeah, I believe it's Yukashenko, the, the one that... Uh, so he he took the Putin deal. And this is what precipitates this. Let me look up his name so I can put it on the screen. Yeah. I believe Yukashenko um, is, is the one, though. Yeah, he... Um, he... Uh, took Putin's deal, which would still keep Ukraine uh, getting aid, but would be within the Russian orbit. Um, yeah, and Victor Yan Yanukovych, Yanukovych. Now, what the uh, what the what the United States did uh, is they conducted uh, a revolution. You know, the CIA and um, Western intelligence folks they basically manufactured a, uh, a revolution in Ukraine, uh, which would eventually um, oust um, Yuka, um, Yaga, sorry. Uh, yeah, Yagoshenko, uh, Yukashenko. Um, and I, I want to emphasize here what Dr. Matza is saying. If you've never heard of the fact that United States manufacts rev manufactures <laughs> revolutions, you need to learn about that because that is just open knowledge. This is not a conspiracy theory whatsoever. No. The CIA has been doing that in all sorts of countries throughout the world. Uh, I mean, I mean, I would even put it earlier, but I mean, especially at the World War Wilson, uh, World War One, that's when the United States, the American Empire gains massive control over the world. But especially after World War Two, you have uh, what happened in the Middle East. We have the Shah was installed. We have Saddam Hussein was a, a puppet of the West. We have all sorts of different revolutions. And could you describe, Dr. Matza, how does the CIA manufacture revolutions? Well, I could, but then I'd have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Um, yeah, I, you know, um, I don't know that the, the, the technical aspects of it. 
but uh, I, I, but I, as you said, I, I, it, it's, it's, it's common knowledge. This is not tinfoil hat conspiracy theory. As you point out, the Shah of Iran was basically put there uh, because the the CIA got rid of the previous uh, occupant. And uh, they wanted the Shah because he was going to turn uh, Iran into a, a Western style. I mean, they, they say that before the Shah was ousted in the Iranian revolution of 1979, that the, the hemlines in Tehran were shorter than in Paris. Uh, so, you know, we exported immodesty and uh, pornography and uh, this Western materialism into this very devout Muslim area. And oh, it, it, surprise, surprise! There was a, a, a religious revolution. I mean, I'm not saying that uh, I'm I'm in favor of the Ayatollah Khomeini, but uh, you you can kind of understand where they're coming from, so to speak, right? Right. Yeah. So uh, this is that. I mean, 1979 in, in Iran was an actual people's revolution, uh, forcing out the Western government which had been imposed on them, as you said. Um, but essentially, the CIA goes in and they study the psychology of, of the different. They use Mar Marxist tactics. This is Saul Alinsky. You study the people, you find out where their fault lines are, who are the different groups that hate each other. And then you put plants into these different groups. And you like, for example, they put Nazis in the Canadian uprising. They've got people waving Nazi flags. Right whatever. Those are just plants from, from various government agencies. I mean, they may or may not be, but we know that this does happen. It, you'd have to go on and, and investigate every single individual, but this was happening at the March for Life. Uh, March for Life, I was in D.C. I saw it happen. This is what you appears the, the to guys be... In the, in the cocky yeah, pants. <laughs> exactly. What appears to be FBI or whoever, there's some kind of wacko pseudo-fascist group that showed up at the March for Life and did some big demonstration, and uh, everybody who was there, I mean... I was like, this is a ridiculous, this, these guys aren't even real. Like you don't even believe it. And it's just a media. They just take, and it happened, showed up on Twitter. They, and showed up, they were st started promoting this, this uh, Patriot front group, which is most likely, we can't prove it right now, but most likely some kind of FBI. So they, they do these things. They study the yeah. psychology. They use Solinsky. They provoke the mob. That's what they, that's what they do. They provoke the mob and these different people to make it look like it's some people's revolution. Right. And that's how they precipitate ver various uh, uh, regime changes. So this is this is what happened. The CIA in 2014, they precipitated a regime change to prevent um, the the president. And, and apologies to all our Ukrainians. It's uh, Yanukovych. We can't even say the president's name because we're we're Anglo's here. But um, so they precipitated this cultural revolution in 2014. Yanukovych flees the country. So he's gone. They they are able to put in a Western puppet government in 2014. So tell us about since 2014. Yeah. So uh, how is, briefly, yeah. So briefly, here's the rundown. November 21st, 2013, Yanukovych says no to the EU deal. December 1st, 2013, large demonstrations on the Maidan. The protesters seize city hall in Kiev. December 17th. Putin announces a $15 billion loan to Ukraine. Uh, February 18th, 2014, there were street clashes that leave 26 dead. Two days later, street clashes that leave 40 people dead. Um, fe February 21st, a deal is worked out for May elections. And on February 22nd, 2014, uh, Yanukovych flees the country. And let, let me just introduce the, the Catholic perspective now, because it's a critical juncture, because the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, which is, I, to my knowledge, I believe it is the largest Eastern Catholic Church, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so they absolutely supported this revolution for Western, because no Catholic wants to be under Moscow. No. Um, hold on just a minute. Hey, bud. some water can you drink some of this water right here son there you go um so yeah so the greek cat so even though this is a cia color revolution which is trying to impose various liberalizations or whatever the catholics would definitely choose that over moscow every single every day of the week and the reason is because as you said the holodomir and that's not it's not even the soviets i mean go as you said go all the way back we didn't even mention this we've you know 988 
um, the conversion of Kiev. But there was actually a Moscow takeover after the Council of Florence and all this. There's a whole huge backstory between the tension between Moscow and Kiev. Yeah. And we don't even have time to get into all this. But right. suffice to say, the Russian Orthodox have oppressed the Catholics in Ukraine uh, yes. for centuries. And so the Soviets just did it even worse. So no right. Catholic in any day of the week wants to be under Moscow, period, full stop. They'll take every single Western deal they can to get out of Moscow. So they supported this revolution. This is a critical point because the Catholics would definitely rather be in NATO than in Russia. But uh, there are that is the, the, the dominant Catholic church, but there's also Ukrainian Orthodox as well. And then there's a whole internal schism between the Orthodox. We don't, we don't really have even time to get into that too. That's a whole nother wrinkle as between well. Kiev and Moscow. Yeah. Right. So um, I just wanted to mention that piece about the Catholic aspect of Catholics in Ukraine. Right. Right. So, um, and of course we should also bring in, uh, bring into bear here that uh, uh, Biden uh, you know, has been having dealings with um, Ukraine. And when Ukraine was going to investigate uh, a company called Burisma, uh, and this is something you can find on the internet, uh, Biden bragged about how he told the president of Ukraine, either you fire the prosecutor who's looking into that, or you're not going to get, was it a billion dollars in U.S. aid? Uh, he wasn't going to allow you know, Barack Obama to, uh, to sign off on the billion dollars. And so they fired the prosecutor. So um, uh, there, there's a definite uh, connection between the West and uh, Ukraine. I mean, it's, 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 there's, there's um, anyway, but we've, we've already spoken about the revolution. Uh, so, um, the uh, the president of uh, I guess maybe now is a good time to maybe transition to the Russian side of things. What do you think? Yeah, sure. It, yeah, and it, the the I mean this this is part of that what you just mentioned the Biden family and whoever else family I've heard Nancy Pelosi's involved all sorts of corruption in Ukraine that's connected with uh, the United States elites. So yeah. Russia and, and as as you mentioned before, Putin is a a total gangster. He's a dictator. Uh, he's a wicked well, man. Well, just just a clarification. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I I didn't say that personally. I was saying in the Western view of things. Okay, uh, right. That is how he is portrayed. So, right. I was asked to first give the Western assessment oh, okay. of the contra Russia, right? And now at some point I'll do the okay, pro Russia. Okay. So, so what's the Ru what's the Russian perspective of Putin then? Uh, well, l let me give the, give the backstory a little bit to to how we get to the Russians themselves. He he is. Uh, in Russia, Putin is like President Trump. He is overwhelmingly popular uh, because he is a populist and he's a patriot. That's how he's viewed uh, as someone who is going to stand up for Russia and not allow Western globalists to mess with Russian culture. So he's extremely popular. I mean, despite obvious, um, how shall we say, uh, uh, using authority to kind of stifle dissent, right, for political uh, political dissent. Um, but let me quickly give a background here. So uh, the West fears Russia because after World War II, the Soviets gobbled up all of these countries and imposed atheistic communism and torture, and they stifled freedom, okay? And that went on f between the 1940s and, the, and 1989. Um, from the Russian perspective, maybe a good way of putting it is this. I think in World War II, uh, the United States lost in the European war something like 250,000 people. I, I could be off by 100,000 or so. But now let's say it was 250,000 uh, soldiers lost, casualties. Um, that's enough to fill up like uh, four baseball stadiums, right? Uh, do you know how many people the Russians lost? Not only soldiers, but civilians. I, they, I believe they it was the worst, the worst losses of any country. Am I right? 25 to immense. 30 million, 25 to 30 million people. Uh, and all their cities were destroyed. Leningrad was uh, starved. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's not four baseball stadiums. That is uh, Los Angeles and New York. <laughs> 
maybe uh, throw in Chicago, all mm -hmm. everybody, every man, woman, and child dead. Yes. So the Russians have a certain view when it comes to defense, uh, and they insist on a buffer between them and potential adversaries. Let's remember, over the last 150 years, 200 years now, it was first Napoleon uh, and then uh, uh, Hitler that invaded Russia and caused untold uh, millions of, of, of loss of life and, and property and everything. Um, so from their perspective, it's important to have some kind of a buffer blocking uh, a potential adversary. Uh, so uh, Putin, and again, he's been in power for 21, uh, 22, 22 years now. He has been known for building up Russia's image and building up Russia's military uh, and having very little patience for uh, anything that's uh, a threat uh, to to Russia. Uh, and so he's very popular among among the people there. And he's actually done an amazing thing. He's, he's over the last 22 years, there have been something like 200,000 churches built. I mean, that would have been un unimaginable, you know, back during the Cold War when when Russia was a godless, uh, atheistic uh, uh, country. Um, now, in terms of uh, how the Russians view uh, Ukraine, uh, of course, the president there is Zelensky. He's a former uh, comedian. Uh, and um, Tulsi Gabbard, uh, the uh, former U.S. Uh, senator, I believe she was, uh, from Hawaii, or she was a congresswoman, uh, she had some interesting things to say in a tweet, which may not be common knowledge. Uh, she said, Ukraine isn't actually a democracy. To hold on to power, Ukrainians, Ukraine's President Zelensky shut down the three TV stations that criticized him and imprisoned the head of the opposition political party, which came in second place in the election, and arrested and jailed its leaders. Um, this is so this is precisely uh, what Putin is accused of doing. So um, there's not much difference if that's all you're going to look at. Like people say that Putin is an autocrat, a dictator. He doesn't care about democratic ways. Well, the same thing could be applied to Zelensky, I I'm sorry to say. Um, and unlike Putin, uh, Zelensky is in favor of uh, uh, marijuana and legalized marijuana, legalized prostitution, free abortion, and he opposes the legalization of, of weapons, or he did up until the war happened, and now they're handing out weapons to civilians. Um, so uh, we have to understand that uh, at the moment, uh, the Western media is portraying Zelensky as this hero and Putin as the villain. But you could very easily characterize it the other way around, uh, because, you know, whatever you're accusing Putin of, Zelensky's done that and worse. Uh, and there's also we need to address another factor here. Um, I wanted to mention because we mentioned Nazis and we've mentioned Nazis a few times. But this is the most in, in the United States. This is what they used in Canada to try to uh, justify the dictatorial powers of Trudeau by saying they were nazis or putting nazi plants or whoever maybe they're real nazis but it doesn't it doesn't matter for the actual issue but i understand there is a descendant of a descendant group of the einsatzgruppen of adolf hitler are you familiar with this Matza? uh, uh the, i i know so there the, are the nazis in ukraine yeah so apparently these are real nazis <laughs> they are descendants of the the einsatzgruppen was groups of civilians which right. hitler weaponized he would just get like the crazy gangs in some city or some town he would just find out the thugs who who are they yeah. here's some weapons and go kill people you hate that's what the einsatz group was and apparently they are so these are real nazis and these are the people that uh they've put into the ukrainian army now any comments on that matzo that wouldn't surprise me if, if that was you know factually the case that would not surprise me um yeah, the Russians will point out to you that, you know, during World War II, uh, there, there was an, a, a, an element in Ukrainian society that went over to the Nazis and uh, they, they even have they've even got statues to this guy. I, I, 
I should have looked up his name before we went on air, but there's a famous partisan, Ukrainian partisan, who allied himself with the Nazis, and they've got they've even got statues to this guy. So um, there there is that element, uh, and there's, I mean, you can find anti-Semitism in every country, but there is a history of anti-Semitism in the Ukraine also. I wouldn't want to put too fine a point on that, but um, there is something to that. It's not like uh, it's a it's a it's a democratic paradise. Yeah, there's certainly a uh, uh, hatred of Jews in Ukraine. There's hatred of Jews in Russia historically too, um, and then there's Jews who are cooperating with anything Bolsheviks later as they as they were before. That's what provoked the Nazis and whatnot. Um, but there's also uh, other Jews who are obviously working with Christians in, in, in society. So it's a really complex thing. Everybody mm -hmm. tries to point it as, as it's all this or all that it's black and white and all this type of thing. So there's a really complex structure. By the way, the, the, the Nazi Ukrainian guy is Bendera. That was his name. Bendera. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That's, um, that's there. Okay. Go ahead. Now. So um, the thing of it is this, again, I'm now talking about advocating the, the Russian side of things. Um, the Russians you know, since 2008, have been trying diplomatically to get NATO and the West to back off. Uh, this is not something that Russia can allow. As you said, it's 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 kind of like the Cuban Missile Crisis all over again, only it's from the Russian perspective. You know, students, I don't know if they still learn this in high school, but <laughs> students in high school used to learn about something called the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, President Monroe, I think, was our fifth president uh, in the early 1800s. And he said, look, the Western hemisphere is off limits to European colonization. All right. Uh, we're not, the United States is not going to tolerate any European power coming into the Caribbean, coming into South America and, and setting up shop. Um, so <laughs> we've had that policy. The United States has had that policy for almost 200 years. And uh, in 1980, was it 1984 or 1983, the United States actually sent mar Marines into the island country of Grenada in the Caribbean under President Reagan because there was a communist coup there. And President Reagan did not want another Cuba uh, in our backyard. In 1959, Fidel Castro took over Cuba. He allied himself with uh, Russia. And it led to the Cuban Missile Crisis. It led to the Soviet Union putting nuclear uh, missiles into uh, into Cuba that could, you know, threaten Washington and and threaten the Eastern Seaboard. And um, again, only 90 miles off the coast of Florida. So um, Reagan did not tolerate an enemy, just you know, in the Caribbean. Uh, JFK did not tolerate an enemy in the Caribbean. Why should Vladimir Putin and the Russians tolerate uh, an enemy staging point on their own border in Ukraine. Uh, we, we, the West has already sent millions of dollars to Ukraine. They've already sent weapons to Ukraine. Uh, and more, more, most, uh, in fact, in terms of weapons, if, uh, if folks go to uh, Ann Barnhart's uh, blog, Ann Barnhart is a friend of mine, she's got a whole story there about U.S., bioweapons laboratories that have been operating in Ukraine for 15, 20 years now. Yes, um, for, former Soviet uh, labs, am I right? No, well, this is, you know, uh, uh, you know how we we funded, uh, the United States government funded research, gain of gain of function research in oh, Wuhan. Oh, the Wuhan lab, yes. <laughs> They've yeah, got I did, similar... I did, my sources confirm that as well. Yeah, um, I mean, I, thought... I could... I could I thought read they were from, former Soviet, yeah. but I don't recall. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah I could read uh, briefly from some of the things that uh, that are in this, but um, uh, so you got that, and you know maybe towards the if, if we have time towards the end, I could I could give more chapter and verse on these bioweapons labs uh, that are again bought and paid for by the United States and the West, right on the border of Russia. I mean. If there was a Wuhan, if there was a Chinese Wuhan, you know, bioweapons lab in Tijuana, Mexico, I don't think that we would, you know, tolerate that for very long. Right. Um, another thing we we should point out here is that 
the globalists, the Freemasons, uh, the ones that want to, uh, you know, d destroy the Christian order are currently the most vocal people against Putin and Russia. For example, uh, the um, you're maybe familiar with the Satanist Marina Abramovic, who does the spirit cooking. <laughs> Thankfully, I'm not familiar, <laughs> but uh, yes. <laughs> She's a, a Satanist and a darling of the Washington, D.C. deep state. Yeah, she's chummy with the, with the Clintons and with all these uh, Soros people. And uh, she has a thing on Twitter, a video on Twitter, saying how we have, to, uh, uh, we have to take a collective stand against Russia, against Christian fundamentalist-fueled aggression. And if that weren't enough, uh, we've got George Soros, of all people, uh, putting out tweets. Uh, saying that the West must stand united against uh, against Russia. Uh, so I don't know, Tim. Uh, when you've got George Soros, you know Doctor Evil, uh, uh, right. who always strikes me as like Jabba the Hutt from Return of the Jedi. <laughs> he just, he's got that look. Uh, you know, Doctor Evil. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Soros is one of the bad Jews. We talked about good Jews and bad Jews. You, you can't actually say that he's a Jew on uh, no. CNN or whatever. They'll just be very uh, <laughs> frustrated with you or whatever. Uh, it right. was a uh, root. Uh, what was it? Newt, Newt Gingrich mentioned him on mentioned his ethnicity or his religious yeah. background. Um, and so this is just to point out that there are ethnic and religious aspects to this. It's not saying all Jews are bad. Every, you know, as soon as you start mentioning that, it's, oh, you're an anti-Semite. No. It's just it's saying that there's ethnic and, and the religious factors here that are at yeah. play. Dinesh, so, Dis Dinesh, right, D'Souza, uh, Dinesh D'Souza did a documentary four years ago called The Death of a Nation. And in that documentary, he shows Soros. I guess he was a teenager at the time or a young man. He actually was was working with the Nazis despoiling right. Jewish families of their jewelry and wealth and uh, disposable. <laughs> and, and he's not apologetic about it either. They, they showed an interview. Uh, I believe Dinesh D'Souza shows an interview with him later on as a grown man. And he's not re really repentant about the whole thing. Right. Uh, this brings up um, Charles Muskowitz is a anti-Marxist Jew. So he's a Jewish writer mm -hmm. writing against the bad Jews. And that's right. what he, so he writes all against these these other Jews who have embraced a lot of communist or Masonic mm -hmm. ideas or whatever, who are in, influence a lot of uh, bad things. So, I mean, you can just go to these Jewish sources to talk about the problems, what's happening within Judaism uh, and Jews that are allying themselves with bad Christians or pagans, whoever they are, Satanists. So right. there, there's this bad cabal of 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 Jews, heretics, pagans or whoever is getting together in an anti-Christian coalition of some kind and so yeah i i don't anything that um the the great reset globalist people are saying and pushing i don't trust it as far as i can throw it and but what's what's interesting to me dr matza is that i've already noticed uh certain catholic media outlets seem to be very very much lockstep with the globalist narrative here now again this is not to say that putin is great or I mean, or even even as a Christian or, you know, he might be just building churches to try to build up his. I mean, he I mean, he might be as as Christian as Trump is a Christian. We don't I mean, I don't really trust Trump's piety, but he might be a, the same exact thing. Now, I don't know his heart or anything, but you know what I mean? So well, yeah, we've it, got it, we've got bad actors on both sides. Mm -hmm. But what's alarming to me, Dr. Matza, is that it seems that mainstream Catholic outlets are starting to become lockstep with a certain narrative that that alarms me what are your thoughts on that yeah i'm afraid that large swathes of catholic media uh have been purchased by the the saint Gallen mafia people by yeah. soros and the globalists by the freemasons uh you know the corruption goes all the way to, to the top as, as far as i can see um, so it, 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 and at the moment, the Catholic media and the secular media are pushing the narrative here that, that Putin is, is the enemy. And so I think when, when you've got Hillary Clinton and, and, uh, uh, Abramovich, the, the, the witch, uh, the Satanist with her spirit cooking and, uh, and George Soros all aligned against Russia, 
Uh, it's got to make you think. Now, I don't, I don't trust that uh, <laughs> that syn synodal way. I don't I don't trust that synodal way of Soros and Clinton and whoever is Satanist witch you're talking about. I don't <laughs> trust that synodal way. Let's, you can't let's make this stuff up. Break. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, but it's, here's here's the real alarming thing to me as well is that when you want to start a war, as we know this from history, World War One, uh, World War Two, I would even count the Civil War. I mean, Revolutionary War, 19, 1776. When you want to start a war, you start to whip up anger. You start to you start to make everything black and white. You start to spread the message in the media, whether you're a pamphleteer in in 13 colonies or your social media. You start to spread the message that the enemy is like pure evil. Right. He is a, a and, and then you start to spread the idea that we have to do something as a matter of justice. And then you institute the draft, and then you you yeah. get the bodies. You, you get all the men to go. They ha they're drafted. They have to go fight a war. And that's how they that's how they do wars these days. Now, we'll talk in a minute about Catholic just war, because right. modern wars, some people say, I think I think it's a reasonable position. Not not entirely. Um, I mean, some people say that just wars aren't even possible anymore. I, and I, I don't know if I agree with that. Right. But the point is, we're in a situation where the elites can control things so heavily and they can whip up the mob so easily. They have so much power. That it's difficult to even, uh, you know, and citizen armies, you know, getting, like you said, millions and millions of people drafted by law to go fight for what kind of economic interest, I don't even know. So I, I got got on my soapbox here a little bit, Dr. Matza. <laughs> yeah, no, no, uh, uh, yeah. The, 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 the globalists, and it, it's, it's not just the Democrats, it's, it's the Bushes, you know, over 30 years ago, uh, uh, George Bush, the senior, told everybody that we need a new world order, you know, and, and uh, uh, George Bush, the junior, uh, got us into Iraq uh, on this flimsy thing that we had, you know, that they had weapons of mass destruction. How many Iraqi civilians are dead today as a result right. of the war in Iraq? Uh, and what's been happened to the Christian communities in Iraq? Exactly. Um, yes. So it, it's the, the the globalists want to first. First of all, they want to destroy America. And by getting us involved in all these costly wars uh, and trying to destroy our economy, too, which is something I can get more more on later. Yeah, I just want to point out Lysandra is pointing out um, that they'll draft women, too. What, what a what a terrible idea yeah. that, that boils my blood. The idea of drafting women into some war. Uh, and you know, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Timothy, this, this might be a good avenue to, to explore something. So last October, President Putin gave a, a speech uh, at a conference called Valdai, and he's got some very interesting things to say. Yes. You wouldn't think that he would have said this, but this is what he said. He said, the advocates of so-called social progress believe they are introducing humanity to some kind of new and better consciousness. The only thing that I want to say now is that their prescriptions are not new at all. It may come as a surprise to some people, but Russia has been there already. After the 1917 revolution, the Bolsheviks, relying on the dogmas of Marx and Engels, also said they would change existing ways and customs, and not just political and economic ones. But the very notion of human morality and the foundations of a healthy society, the destruction of age-old values, religion, and relations between people, up to and including the total rejection of family. We had that too. Encouragement to inform on loved ones. All this was proclaimed progress and by the way, was widely supported around the world back then and was quite fashionable, just as today. By the way, the Bolsheviks were absolutely intolerant of opinions other than theirs. This, I believe, should call to mind some of what we are witnessing now. Looking at what is happening in a number of Western countries, we are amazed to see the domestic practices, which we fortunately have left, I hope, in the distant past. The fight for equality and against discrimination has turned into an aggressive dogmatism bordering on absurdity 
when the works of the great authors of the past, such as Shakespeare, are no longer taught at schools or universities because their ideas are believed to be backward. The classics are declared backward and ignorant of the importance of, of gender or race. In Hollywood, memos are distributed about proper storytelling and how many characters of what color or gender should be in a movie. This is even worse than the agitprop department of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. So we've got uh, Putin here uh, saying that you know Russia doesn't want to be woke. He says in a number of Western countries, the debate over men's and women's rights has turned into a perfect phantasmagoria. Look, beware of going where the Bolsheviks once planned to go. Not only communalizing chickens, but also communalizing women. One more step and you will be there. Uh, zealots of these new approaches uh, want to even go so far as to abolish these concepts altogether. Anyone who dares mention that men and women actually exist, which is a biological fact, risk being ostracized. I repeat, this is nothing new. In the 1920s, the so-called Soviet Kulturtriggers also invented some news speak, believing they were creating a new consciousness and changing values that way. As I've already said, they made such a mess, it still makes one shudder at times. <clears throat> so like, like I said, uh, I mean, everything Putin just said is absolutely 100% true. Now, is he saying it because he's just getting political power over it and he realizes that the Russian people are at heart pious Christians and he's, okay. you know, getting power out of this? Or is he a pious Christian? I doubt that he's a pious Christian very much. Well, but let me but, take that uh, advocate for a second. Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Constantine, somebody that we respect because he helped to build Christendom. And in, in fact, the Orthodox go so far as to esteem him as a saint. Uh, not, not something that the Catholic Church you know, never did in the West. But uh, people might not know it was Constantine who helped who convoked the Council of Nicaea to defeat uh, Arianism. It was Constantine who legalized Christianity. And without that, we would never have had uh, the, the glory of Christendom, the ages of Christendom, the ages of faith. And yet uh, people might not know about Constantine is that he, he ju judicially executed his own wife and his son. And not only that, he, he knocked off all the male members of his family who could potentially take the throne from him. Uh, and yet he he kind of stole heaven because he was Made baptized the, yes. right. two weeks before he died. Uh, as you know, baptism wipes the slate completely clean. Even temporal punishment is wiped out when you get baptism. Uh, so it reminds me of the story of, uh, of a grandmother that was talking to uh, uh, Mother Angelica once. And Mother Angelica was trying to comfort her because her her husband had just died, and her her husband they were married I think it was like fifty years together, and um and she and uh, Mother Angelica said to her, "You seem upset," and she says, "Yeah, I'm very upset. He mistreated me all these years, and then he got baptized right before he died. The old geezer." <laughs> Uh, well, I, I mean, I think that this is this is kind of how I viewed Trump. Um, you know, the I don't think that he is or was a pious Christian, but he said the right things and he was willing to play ball with the Christians, willing to give them greater influence. Um, so uh, are you saying that Putin may be not so pious like Constantine was not so pious? but he's still doing good in some senses. I, I think he could be a diamond in the rough. I mean, th th this is why I guess now we can kind of maybe segue into the, the Fatima aspect of this and the spiritual um, aspect of this to whole discussion here. Um, I, I think he could be a diamond in the rough in the sense that, as you know, you've, you've had me on the show debating Robert Sungenis and I, advocate Father Gruner's position that Russia was never consecrated. 
And I've been telling this to people for 33 years now, but nobody seems to listen to me except maybe you. But um, I've been preaching. We need the Pope and the bishops, all the bishops, to consecrate Russia to Mary's Immaculate Heart, or otherwise we are all going to fall to communism and world war and the annihilation of nations. And so, surprise, surprise, the threat is still with us and is, is, is heightened right now as we're just a few steps away from uh, thermonuclear war here uh, or, or economic devastation, which we can talk about a little bit later. But um, so in, in terms of Fatima, uh, I think that when John Paul consecrated the world, uh, actually, people might not know this, so let me just spell this out. On March 25th, right, the Feast of the Incarnation, the Feast of the Annunciation, March 25th, 1984, John Paul the Great, St. John Paul the Great, in St. Peter's Square, consecrated the world to Mary's Immaculate Heart. And then he departed from his prepared text and said, enlighten especially those people who are still awaiting your consecration and confiding. Now, now wait a minute. He just consecrated the whole world. So who are these people who are still awaiting Mary's consecration and confiding? The Martians? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it was a reference to Russia that he was acknowledging that he did not consecrate Russia, even though he was supposed to, all right? But he felt pressured by, again, the, the mafia inside the Vatican, uh, Casseroli, and all these globalist Freemasons. And um, the great exorcist of Rome, um, uh, your, uh, Father Gabriel Armorth, was a witness yes. and said that John Paul wanted to consecrate Russia, but he didn't. So the upshot of this is, is this. Even though he didn't actually name Russia the way he was supposed to, I think God gave certain graces and allowed certain beneficial things to happen, such as the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now, again, I talk more, I'm going to be talking more about this in my online course in church history, my online course in world history. If folks go to edmundmaza.com, they can sign up. But my take on it is this. Um, I think Galitzin was right because Galitzin predicted the fall of the Berlin Wall, the, the liberalization of Eastern Europe, the end of the monopoly on the Communist Party. I think there was originally a plan to do a Trojan horse and de deceive the West. But at some point, I think thanks to John Paul's consecration of the world, even though it wasn't Russia, I think certain graces were brought down on Russia so that I, I honestly, today, I don't think that Putin is a secret communist. I, I think that he's a potential Constantine. and But we do need that consecration of Russia, or otherwise things could get very messy. Okay, so this is, this is what generates the controversy about the Fatima consecration. Um, if viewers or listeners are not familiar, this is the apparition of Our Lady of Fatima, the greatest public miracle since the Moses crossed the Red Sea in 1917, right as the Bolsheviks were taking over Russia. And it, Our Lady requested um, in 1929 that the Pope and all the bishops con consecrate Russia to her Immaculate Heart so that Russia will be converted and there will be peace. And we've debated there. There's essentially three views. The mainstream view is that John Paul II did this in 1984. Um, the minority view is that uh, this was not done. The consecration is still going on. And there's even a more minor view, which is that Pius XII actually did it uh, during his reign. And I, it does appear, as you said, it does appear uh, we could, uh, as you said, Robert Justin um forwards the third thesis. And I think we agreed as part of that debate, I, I believe, that nevertheless, there was graces. And obviously, right. World War II did end. Uh, so there was an improvement. And uh, there seems to be some good things happening here and there. And as you said, the fall of communism, um, certainly. So there is, a, there is a bit of an overlap between these three views. There is an overlap. So there's sort of like a common ground, if you will. But um, so it does appear. Let, let's talk about um, uh, 
World War Three at this point. Um, one, so we haven't really touched much on the economic factors, uh, but I do know that there is Russian gas is a critical factor. Much of Eastern Europe is is still dependent on Russian gas. There, you mentioned the grain. That's a huge critical factor in, in Ukraine. And we also didn't really mention China much. Right. Um, do you want to comment on China as a player? And China is becoming a, a global communist empire at this point. Uh, any comments on any of that? Yeah, I have been trying to raise the alarm about communist China now for over 30 years since Tiananmen Square. People might not be old enough to remember uh, June 4th, 1989. There were peaceful democratic protesters in Tiananmen Square in Beijing, and the Chinese Communist Party brought in the tanks and killed everybody. There's a famous image of a protester standing in front of a line of tanks. Uh, so I have been telling people, don't buy stuff made in China. But unfortunately, all, all the 99 cents discount stores sell all these things that are made in China. Um, I, I, I went to Queens College of the City University of New York and uh, they sponsored a, a, a business meeting once with all these big executives from all these American corporations who were just giddy over the idea of going to China and opening up all these business deals. And of course, that's only gotten worse over the years. We know that you know, Nike and Apple and all these American companies, which are now, which are now global you know, conglomerates, uh, m making money hand over fist because of Chinese Slave labor, the, the, the Lao Beijing of China, the, the average people in China are getting paid pennies on, uh, for, for, their, for their salary, literally, uh, because it's a communist system. The Communist Party runs everything. Uh, and we're at fault. The West is at fault for being in bed with these people for the sake of the almighty dollar. And, and this is so Nixon back in and again, in my course. I, I go. I'm going to go through all of this in my world history course. How Nixon opened the door to all this by actually going to China and visiting uh, Mao Zedong, one of the greatest greatest mass murderers, worse than Hitler and Stalin statistically, and opening up. You see, this is all part of this, the strategy that the ex KGB agent Anatoly Galitsyn tried to warn the West about that they would use China and Russia would pretend to be at odds with each other. To get America to side with China, and not and not realize what they were falling for until it's too late, and I think Wuhan, the Wuhan flu, COVID, uh, brought this up to our attention, just how indebted we are to the People's Republic of China in terms of trade, in terms of uh, if if China takes over Taiwan, which they might try to do now. Um, we're not going to have the, the, the components to build computers. We're going to be at the mercy of the uh, Communist Party to a greater extent than we already are, the, of the Chinese Communist Party. We know that the Bidens uh, took millions of dollars from these guys and are compromised. Um, now, at the same time, we've been putting sanctions on Russia over the years. And what have we been doing? We've been driving an ally that we need into the camp of the Chinese. You know, I, I think because of the graces of what John Paul did, at some point, I think the Russian the Russians became independent of whatever the original plan was, but they're still chummy with China. I asked Bishop Schneider about this. I don't know if I'm being clear on this, but one time I interviewed Bishop Athanasius Schneider of Kazakhstan, and I said, how come... Russia is so chummy with China and Cuba and North Korea and Venezuela and all the enemies of democracy and, and of America. And he said he has to do that for political and economic reasons, because otherwise Russia would be alone in the world. It, it needs something to defend itself against uh, the globalists. Uh, so China is an important part of this. Uh, China here's an economic thing people are not thinking of that they should think of. And that is that already the United States and its allies have kicked out certain Russian banks from the SWIFT system. Are, uh, should I explain that to the folks? What? Oh, what yeah, please, please explain that. The SWIFT system. So since 1973, there is this um, electronic um, 
uh, clearinghouse for international transactions, banking transactions all throughout the world. Obviously, the, the American dollar is the reserve currency that everybody wants and everybody uses. Okay, um, and so um, the uh, the 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 SWIFT banking system has now cut off the Russian central bank. In, in a similar way to how they cut off the Iranians uh, and some other nations, I, I think maybe North Korea, I'm not sure. But the, the problem is if they if they should completely cut off the Russians from being able to use American dollars in international transactions, they're going to force the Russians to align themselves with the Chinese even more. The Chinese would like their currency, the Juan, I think it's called, to be uh, to be the world currency, the world reserve currency, and if Brazil and India and some other nations, if they were to go along with that, and America, our dollars stopped being the reserve currency that everybody uses, then our thirty trillion dollar debt, we would not be able to just keep printing money like we've done over the last 35, 40 years. We just we have the luxury of being able to print as much money as we want without really any. Uh, visible, uh, tangible effects on us. But now, I, I, look, sorry to cut yeah. in, but would you Please. say that? So then, would you say that China is really a, a very much a third party between Russia and NATO right now? I would like say kind of China, playing both sides if they want. Go ahead. Yeah, China is our biggest existential existential threat. Okay, because uh, okay, they, you, you hear yeah. it here first. China is the biggest <laughs> existential threat. <laughs> Uh, they uh, and and yes, they uh, Russia will continue to align itself with China the more we poke the stick at them and and uh, put economic sanctions on them and call them bad names. Uh, I think Trump had the right idea. Uh, it'd be nice if we could get along. Uh, it doesn't mean we have to approve of everything that Putin does, but it would be we need a strategic partner against the Chinese because we can no longer economically, or even militarily, uh, really stand up to the Chinese in the coming years. I mean, uh, compare the uh, American military now that's been vaccinated and suffering all these physical problems. It's and woke. Woke. Yeah. It's it, the critical race theory. I it's mean, like, it's a joke. What is? Oh, no, that was the NFL is gay. Actually, that was sorry. That was their I say that that was their media. I'm not saying that as a phrase, but that was their uh, media push. But the um, that's there was another that. thing. There was that media of the army where there was all about this like lesbian woman who became a soldier or some kind of weird gender thing. That's the U.S. Army these oh, days. I, yeah. Uh, again, if you go to Ann Barnhart's blog, she's got a video of a recruitment, a recruitment video for the American military versus a recruitment military for the Russian military. Uh, just, right. the, 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 it's night and day. One By is the way, more masculine yeah. than the other. Uh, spoiler uh, there's, alert. There's, de <laughs> there's definitely a loss of testosterone yeah. uh, in, in the world. Um, and that's another thing about Russia. It uh, you're not allowed to spread sodomite propaganda among young people in Russia. It's actually a crime. Uh, you're not allowed to advertise for abortion services. Uh, you're not allowed to have abortions up into a certain uh, up, up to a certain period. So now, uh, now let me progress. Now there is a, a challenge to the Russian. Russia is Christianized. Putin is a Constantine. Um, and people mention various statistics in terms of highest abortion rates and whatnot. Uh, but the other factor is that, as I understand it, Russia has fallen in line with the uh, COVID lockdown, everything uh, since the beginning of this whole COVID ridiculousness. Uh, so hasn't Russia been taking money from who knows, just like India did, took money and they locked down their people and people were starving. I, hasn't Russia been taking money from the same Soros, whoever, and doing the same thing. Isn't Russia just another well, globalist to player? Knowledge, to my knowledge, Russia has the, its own vaccine. It's called Sputnik. Uh, and Sputnik. They, they developed their own vaccine. So. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, okay. Yeah. It's, so it's not like they're making Bill Gates uh, richer than he already is or making Soros uh, you know, richer than he already is. It's unfortunate that that Putin has, to a certain extent, done lockdowns and pushed the vaccine, although they haven't gone as far as, you know, uh, certain states in America or even the federal government in America in terms of imposing the vaccine. But 
unfortunately, even somebody who's really admired as a Christian, uh, Victor Urban of Hungary, was quoted back in November as saying, look, everybody's going to have to get vaxxed. Hmm. So uh, it's it's a mania it, that affects even the, 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 the more sane or, or, the, the, or let's put it this way, those that lean more towards the Christian order. Uh, it's even affecting them. Uh, but I, I would say yeah. it's it, the, the the people in Russia are more free c compared to us in terms of the in, in terms of the vaccine uh, right. and these vaccine mandates. Although it's not entirely, you know, not entirely free. Yeah, and and to be fair, there are I, there are good Christian educated doctors who do support the vaccine, and they then the, the 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 bottom line with the COVID thing is that it's two years old, and no scientific consensus has ever been made about after right. two years ever i mean not, i mean i'm exaggerating here but the point is there's there's just no way we can we can have a rock solid consensus to at least with no doubts no you know absolute certainty so i mean i th i in my opinion I, we do need to give the benefit of the doubt to some i mean some people feel very strongly about it. i don't think i don't think it's old enough for us to feel strongly sure. because i don't think we have enough all the information about everything so I, I hesitate to be too strongly opinionated about COVID, its origins, how bad it is, vaccines, all sorts of things. But we can all agree for sure that there should be no vaccine mandate forcing people's consciences uh, to be violated, of course. So uh, I think you're pointing out that factor as well. Um, now, what haven't we covered? What do we need to cover that we haven't covered? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I suppose one of the questions is... Uh... You know what? What does Putin want? I mean, why did they invade, and what's the end game? Is he so? And people have been speculating on that. Um, and again, e economically, we have to be careful how we respond. Uh, it's one thing to condemn what happened, and it's another thing to like cut your nose off to spite your face. Um, Russia is the is the world's biggest supplier of nitrogen, and of of all things, fertilizer. And right now is the spring planting season uh, for America and other, you know, northern hemisphere uh, countries. Uh, Russia is also one of the world's biggest suppliers of oil and natural gas. And unfortunately, uh, Biden went back on Trump's policies of, you know, under Trump, we were the world's largest exporter of oil. Uh, and now we've we've gone back to being an importer uh, and getting our resources from. Now, we're not in as bad a situation as Germany. Which, which gets so much of its energy from Russia or the other European countries, which are kind of at, at the mercy of Russia when it comes to, at least in the winter time. <laughs> um, but we have to keep these things in mind is that um, also we should keep in mind that Russia and China are much better at cyber uh, warfare than we are. And they've also actually got uh, hypersonic missiles. That's missiles that can travel, you know, 10 times the speed of sound or, something on, on that magnitude. And we don't have that yet, you know, thanks to uh, the, you know, our, our, you know, Judas's and, and uh, Benedict Arnold's within our own camp uh, who have, uh, you know, infiltrated uh, the military and, uh, or infiltrated the government and try to cut off uh, what we need to keep ourselves strong. So um, we're, we're, in, we're in a rather tricky place. And so if, if all Putin wants is not to have, you know, uh, a, a staging point on his border for bioweapons or conventional weapons or nuclear weapons, then uh, it might behoove us to, to go along with some kind of peace deal rather than uh, provoke World War III. I mean, just pragmatically speaking. Yeah, uh, Phil says, should, should we as faithful Catholics just set back and be neutral? Um, well, we're never neutral because we're locked in eternal war with the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's As right. we just started Lent, we are always the church militant fighting against our eternal enemies. And I, at this point, I want to bring in the demonology of geopolitics because the, we've mentioned all these different factors and different elites, different people pulling strings, the ethnic, uh, religious factors, all sorts of different factors. But ultimately, th this is being orchestrated by the fallen angels. Satan and the fallen angels. That's the real conspiracy. Uh, obviously, there are real conspiracies between Masons and all sorts of people. Obviously, that's real. But the only conspiracy that has total global control, as it were, were the, the global conspiracy is Satan and the fallen angels. 
and they they are the ones provoking world leaders to you know go to these who knows what meetings where they're doing who knows what with satanists and we god help them i don't even know all, all the black magic they're getting into uh they're the ones provoking all these things and they want they ultimately want these nations to kill each other and they want they want this type of thing they want us all to um be inflamed in our passions they want us to go to hell because they envy us for taking their place in the hierarchy of angels but thankfully christ is king over all of it and he is the one who went to the desert to destroy the devil now this is not just a sermon let's talk practicals because pope francis pope francis's message i didn't read the whole message i don't know if you read that but all, all i heard was that george weigel criticized pope francis for talking too much about partisan interests and not enough about this is an unjust war of aggression now as soon as someone starts talking like that in any modern war i start to lose trust because as as we've mentioned in this modern wars are so complex there's so many different factors different players people are provoking other people to invade people are invading uh as you as we've mentioned before cia is you know manufacturing revolutions all sorts of th factors are at play so it's i mean <laughs> at least in terms of this soundbite from pope francis i didn't read the whole thing but in terms of the soundbite versus george weigel i definitely tr trust the soundbite from pope francis about partisan interests rather than paying this as this black and white thing, as George Weigel seems to have done in his interview at National Register. So what are your thoughts on practical things Catholics can do wherever they're at, whether in, they're in families, cities, communities, maybe they are in government, uh, maybe they're just interacting with other Catholics, reading the news and reading different narratives as, as they come out. What are your thoughts on practical things? What should we do to not be neutral? We, we can pray the family rosary every day. We could try and double up on that for, for the sake of Lent. Most uh, important we, thing, for sure. We can try to end abortion. If, there, if there's one thing or two things that are driving, you know, Our Lady of Fatima said war is a punishment for sin. All right. So you don't, Very want, you don't, like, yes. you don't like war and abortion, you know, peacefully, uh, prayerfully. Uh, but and maybe, it, maybe God willing, if we can overturn Roe versus Wade, you know, with this this June, when the Supreme Court lets us know what they decided, uh, maybe God will give us a miracle and we'll overturn Roe versus Wade and that will help bring about peace in the world. But if it should come down the other way and Roe versus Wade is not done away with, then uh, we, we're toast <laughs> because God is not yes. going to tolerate the slaughter of the unborn another 50 years the way he has the last 50 years. God we, judges it, nations. It, it, precisely. Yes. Precisely. And it, even uh, somebody like Abraham Lincoln uh, talked about that. And during the Civil War had days of prayer and fasting so we can pray, we can fast, especially against abortion. Um, you know, allowing the sin of Sodom to be promoted as if it's a wonderful thing and, and as if it's a human right. That also brings that's one of the sins that cries to heaven for vengeance. That's bringing down God's vengeance down on us. All right. So if you if you've, if you've had enough of plague, if you've had enough of war, uh, then we have to pray for an end to all of that. We have to talk to family members who are living sinful lifestyles and try to shake them out of it and talk to them uh, and and pray for them and penance for them. Uh, we can't just sit around and twiddle our thumbs. We 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 are the church militant. We have to stand up for the truth, and the truth will set us free. Um, and then also, I, and, and this is. You know, you know, this is my pet project. If if world peace has been entrusted to Our Lady, our Lord told Sister Lucia that he would not convert Russia without the Pope consecrating and the bishops consecrating Russia to Mary's Immaculate Heart, because he said, I want my whole church to recognize that moral miracle that's going to happen, the conversion of Russia and world peace. As, as being attributed to our Blessed Lady, the Queen of Heaven and Earth, the uh, you know, Queen of Martyrs. He wants her to get all the credit when that happens. And so uh, we need to um, be devoted to Our Lady, and we, we need to – and this, this is why I've been pushing the consecration. It's also why I've been pushing why we need to investigate who is the rightful pope, because only the rightful pope can make the consecration – 
that's going to exercise the demons from this world in this in the, in, the, in the way that Mary prophesied at Fatima. So my I would urge people to talk to their bishops or cardinals, uh, especially the ones that we know are, are good and holy, which you could probably count on your hand, but ask them to please investigate what happened with Pope Emeritus and the papal resignation of not nine years ago, because that may be a key to us getting out of the, the quandary that we're in. I don't want to put too more fine a stress on it in this particular episode, but that's what I would say. Yeah. And, and, um, uh, we just had a show about this, Dr. Matza and I. Obviously, we disagree on this, but I think one of your best sources, Dr. Matza, in this and that conversation a couple of days ago was mm -hmm. when you, I think it was Monsignor Bucks, it, mm -hmm. but it was a mainstream source, Camino guy, I think from 2018 or something, where he actually said what you just said. We need to investigate the resignation. So in fairness to to your point of view, Dr. Matza, that's a very good source to you know bring to, to that question. Um I wanted to another live chat question is asking um, what if this is the chastisement of the West? Cause this, this uh, you know, the, we talk about the consecration of Russia. Fatima talks about the errors of Russia, which is obviously communism. And then some, uh, which has spread throughout the world at this point, we've got Congress, China. We've also, we've also got the communist West, not only the EU, but we've got, as you said, the United States, um, Father John Hardin, one of the last late great uh, great Jesuits, classical Jesuit mold, he said that in the, the United States is the greatest Marxist country in the world in the 1990s. He said that. Um, so the United States is following the same path of Marxism. And maybe people say we need to consecrate the United States more than Russia, as some say. Uh, now, I, I want to say in fairness, uh, there is, you know, this critique of Putin, um, you know, that this is all just a, a show. He's a ruthless dictator. Uh, I, I'm, I saw the, um, the Russian Catholic. He's a, he's a Russian Catholic. He's becoming a, a monk. He mentioned how Putin, he said that Putin's just this, he believes him. He doesn't even believe in God. He's a ruthless dictator. So there is another side to that. Um, but do you think that Russia might be the uh, instrument of God's chastisement of the West? What are your thoughts on that? It very well could be. It very well could be. Fatima is not the only apparition to uh, warn us about Russia causing wars. And and uh, I believe it's, uh, maybe you can correct me, uh, Sister El Elena Aiello. Uh, Are you talking about the one in Ukraine? No, no. Well, actually, in terms of Ukraine, I've got a book here. It's available from Queenship uh, Press. It's called Witness by the late Yosef Terilea. I think that's how you say his name. Um, he was in Soviet prisons for trying to spread Christianity in the Soviet Union. Uh, and he claimed to have revelations from Our Lady, Our Lady of Horushev, I think it's pronounced. Um, and so this book came out 30 years ago. Now, there are some people who think that... Uh, after First, I should say that this is not an, yet an approved apparition. Um, secondly, I should point out that there are some folks online uh, who are critical of him and claim that this is a false apparition. For example, uh, allegedly Our Lady spoke to him on November 20th, 2005 and said, here's like a sample of what she said. Look, love for the devil is homoeroticism. Their God is the Antichrist. Their altar is Tibet. Their angels are the fallen angels. Their priests from three races of snake. Their ideas, nirvana of the new age. Their concepts, karma and change of body. You are surrounded by one illusion. You read horoscopes. Uh, this actually doesn't sound like language that Mary would use in an apparition. So folks can investigate further. Um, these alleged apparitions of Our Lady in Ukraine back in the late 1980s and 1990s and until his death, I think he died in 2009, um, Joseph Terilea. Uh, he actually met John Paul II a few times. I don't know what, what John Paul II personally felt about the apparitions. or, But anyway, um, <clears throat> so um, what was the – I'm sorry, I, I missed the – I forgot the – Oh, just the, uh, the Russia as a, a an instrument of God's chastisement of the West. Yeah, so – um, Blessed Elena Aiello, I think is her name, uh, she was receiving, uh, allegedly, uh, visions from our Lord 
during World War II, and she wrote to Benito Mussolini uh, warning him that he should not align himself with Hitler. You know, and this is an Italian, this is in mi Italy? Mystic, Italian mystic. Okay. And, um, the, you know, the God wanted to use Mussolini, <clears throat> but Mussolini didn't get with the program, and he aligned himself with Hitler. And uh, she said that's going to end badly for him, and we all know, <laughs> we all know that it did. But um, in her visions, she says she saw Russian forces invading Italy, and she saw the red flag uh, from, um, you know, hanging from, you know, the dome of the parliament or the churches or, or whatever. And uh, and by the way, I, I, I should point out that uh, I could have told you that Putin was going to invade on the day that he invaded, because that was the uh, I think that was the waning hours of Red Army Day. There's a, there's a national holiday in Russia uh, celebrating the army. And uh, I think that was the exact day or the day after that they invaded. And <clears throat> some people pointed out that there's, there, there are clips, film clips of Russian tanks going to Ukraine with the Soviet flag on them and saying, you see, they're, they're, they're still communist. No, they, they did that because it's Red Army Day. It's the, like, the anniversary of the Russian army. So I, that's why they had these um, World War II style um, Soviet, Soviet flags. Okay. But anyway, so there are private revelations. I don't know. She, I think she's a blessed, but I'm not sure that her revelations are necessarily approved. Uh, but anyway, so you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that if we don't pray the rosary and wear the sc brown scapular and do prayer and penance, that uh, Russia can still conquer the cause a lot of trouble, even if it's not communist. And this 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 shows how. Um... And this is how it was in the Holy Scriptures. I mean, you read, you read uh, First Samuel, Second Samuel, First Second Kings. God uses the prophets; He uses the saints to inform the kings and princes of this world, and asks them to repent. And if they don't repent, it, God will punish the nation uh, for the sins of the king or the sins of the nation right. as a whole. So God, le God does give these these leaders. He gives them a chance to repent, and he's given all of us a chance to repent. And I think the important thing here is that we need to guard against the vice of curiosity. Vice of curiosity is when you study too much useless knowledge that distracts from your duties of your state in life. So if you're the father or mother of a family, you're raising your children, we can get caught up in all these things, all these political things. You can chase after all sorts of apparitions. There's right. good and bad apparitions. There's fake rep apparitions, uh, and you can you can get lost in that pretty easily. And then you, next thing you know, you realize you've neglected the duties of your state in life. You may have gotten lax in your prayer life. You've fallen into sin, God forbid, something, you know, because you, you were sucked into the voice of curiosity. So the important thing here is that we need to understand our duties of your state in life. If you are a Catholic lay ruler, you're going to study these things way more because that's the duties of your state in life. And God will also give, uh, these these opportunities for repentance where there will be some saint who arises who informs the rulers and gives them a chance to repent and ultimately we need we need to just have a uh, firm faith hope and charity to our lord christ the king who is king over the whole, the nations he is the one who rules the nations psalm 21 talks about how he he rules the nations <clears throat> and he is king and so he is in control so we don't need to worry, uh, pray, hope, don't worry. Uh, you know, so let's, the most important thing, perhaps practically we need to do is have a really good Lent, repent of your sins, grow in holiness. What are your thoughts? Demiza? You're I'm totally with you, Tim. And I would add again, very, uh, <laughs> very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here in, in my own interest here. Uh, if, if folks want to learn the genuine history uh, of the church and of what's going on in the world, uh, let me share a tidbit with you uh, that is fascinating that might throw light on the current um, situation. I don't think folks know this. The very first appearance of the of the Rus, that is the modern day Ukrainians, uh, the modern day Russians, the very first time we encounter them in history, they're actually invading Constantinople. Tim, maybe you're familiar with this story. Uh, it, it, yeah, I... I... I'm not familiar with the particular invasion. I remember that they were, I mean, they were ruthless pagans. I mean, the Russians are kind of like the Spanish of the Eastern Europe. Like the Spanish are very 
intense you know <laughs> yeah, these but, are, these uh, are yeah slavs and slavs and vikings that kind of intermarried right. and so uh, uh i gotta be gotta be careful my in-laws are gonna get on my case um but let me tell you the story about what happened in june of the year 860 um the um so constantinople at that time was the capital of the byzantine empire which was the the christian east and Constantinople and the Byzantine emperor uh, and his armies were the only thing keeping the Muslims from overrunning all of Christian Europe. And um, at that time, the uh, the uh, the emperor and his uh, armies were fighting against the Muslims Abbasids in central Turkey, and set, and uh, they had taken uh, the the navy with them. And so it left uh, Constantinople vulnerable. So what happened is on June 18th of the year 860, about 200, you know, Viking Russian longships sailed into the Bosporus, which is the main harbor of, of, Byz of Byzantium. Uh, and there were about, you know, 50 to 75 men on each ship. So altogether, that's about 10 to 15,000 uh, barbarians at your gate. Okay. Um, and since there was no army or navy to defend the city, uh, the only thing that was protecting the people of Constantinople were the walls uh, of the city. Um, and um, But things got bad because they started to attack all the places that were outside the walls of Constantinople. And they began pillaging and setting things on fire and uh, uh, residents were you know, taken as slaves. Uh, and it went, on for, it went on for days and days. So... What happened was um, the patriarch uh, got a relic of our Blessed Lady. Let's see if I can find the name of it. It's called the Black Black Kerne, B L A C H E R N A E. Um, it's 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 supposed to be the cloak that Our Lady wore when she gave birth to Christ. And uh, what they did was the the emperor and the patriarch. Uh, I think actually it was Patriarch Photius. Uh, those of you who have read Timothy's book or taken my courses, you know a thing or two about Patriarch Photius. But um, he had this robe of the Theotokos, and they formed a procession uh, which marched along the walls of the city, and then they dipped it into the Sea of Marmara. Uh, and as a result of that, a great storm came up and wrecked most of the Russian fleet uh, and uh, what, whatever was left of the fleet had to sail back to uh, Kiev. So it's Our Lady, the Theotokos, the Mother of God, who saved Christian civilization when the, Ukraine, Ukraine, the original ancestors of the Ukrainians and Russians were on the attack and were pagans. I, so, you know, just the same way it started is probably the way it's going to end. It's Our Lady who is going to bring peace uh, to the world. And furthermore, I, I, I would be neglect if I didn't, uh, derelict if I didn't mention this. Father Malachi Martin, who I know is a controversial figure, but uh, he claimed to have read The Third Secret of Fatima. And he gave an interview, Father Martin, well, he died in 1999, but he gave an interview to uh, traditional Catholic Bernard Jansen in 1997 and it seems you can find this video on YouTube. He may have overslipped part of the third secret of Fatima. Listen to what he said. Now, as regards the mystery of Fatima, it still stands. So Russia is within the plans. Why? Uh, that would take me too far afield into papal secrets. Why Russia and Kiev are involved in the final solution of this problem, but they are. They are part and parcel, and it's really God's choice. And it is purely and simply God's choice, like he chose the Jews. He has his own favorite solutions. I wouldn't have chosen Russians or Kiev or the East for salvation, but salvation is to come from the East." End quote. 
And th- th- <laughs> this is a totally another tactic. We have a we have a whole show on this, which is the prophecies about Russia's conversion and the end of the Mohammedans, the end of Islam as well. There there, there are Catholic prophecies involving um, the conversion of the Mohammedans via Our Lady as well. So uh, that's a whole another show we have with Matt Gaspers. Um, so this is so God is in control and God's doing something. And God will bring it to completion, whether we like it or not. And uh, you know, because I'm a, I'm a little uppity sometimes. Um, I would, I would petition Rome to finally release the third secret of Fatima, because I I I, I agree with Father Gruner that the third secret of Fatima will tell us who the who the legitimate Pope is, and what's been going on, and it may even have a clue about geopolitics with Russia and Kiev. Um, I, th- I think that in 2000, uh, I agree with Mother Angelica. Mother Angelica said, I don't think we got it all, right? Because some people say the third secret was revealed completely, mm-hmm. but actually all they revealed was a vision, but no description, no description of what that vision means. So I would implore the Vatican to finally release the full third secret of Fatima, and then we won't have to speculate about things we've been speculating about. Yeah, and that's the, the whole other Fatima controversy. We And we don't have time to get into that, but we've covered that on many other videos as well. We have a whole Fatima series where we debated all sorts of different topics uh, this past summer. Um, so any final thoughts here? Um, I mean, I think the conclusion is, according to the duties of a state in life, we are not neutral at all, but we want to fight the world of flesh and the devil as they appear in geopolitics as we can. Any final thoughts, Dr. Matza? Thank you so much for all of your analysis. Oh, thank you. Thank you for for having me. And um, I would just say, you know, it, it, recently I just watched Lord of the Rings again. And J.R.R. Tolkien was, of course, a, a devout Catholic. And he once wrote to his son, telling him that the greatest thing in the world is Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. So if you really want to know where it's at you got to visit jesus in the blessed sacrament and take comfort from him there i don't know if people realize this but the one ring which ultimately frodo is able to spoiler alert (laughs) spoiler alert the frodo is able to destroy the ring with a little help from Gollum. Gollum. um on march 25th now march 25th is not an accident that tolkien brought that up March 25th in, in the medieval times was believed to be the, the, the date that God made the world, the date that Jesus was incarnated in the womb of the Theotokos, and the day that he died on Good Friday and freed us from sin. So the ring is, is it's not a direct analogy, but you could argue that the ring is like original sin, and, a, and it was destroyed by our Lord, you know, Frodo, on uh, just uh, March the 25th. So as Galadriel tells uh, Frodo, even the smallest person can change the course of the world. Uh, Our Lady came to three shepherd children at Fatima in 1917. So uh, we might be saved by the devotion of little kids. Uh, we, your, your own children, right? Asking for water to, <laughs> earlier uh, by their prayers. You know, God hears the prayers of, of, of children, especially. So um, uh, encourage your kids to pray for peace. And we should pray for peace also. And um, even the smallest person can change the course of, uh, of events. Uh, that's a fantastic way to end this, Dr. Mazza, because we've talked about curiosity. But I think that's that's the beautiful thing about God is that he he glories in using individual saints to accomplish his will in history. And this is what I think of the story of Gideon and how Gideon, God told him to send away his his army. So there was a little smaller and smaller force so that God would get the glory. And that's and uh, that's the the glory of God is that he works through individual people. So we never need to don't need to get give up hope at all. But remember that God is in control and that he does work through the saints and he the saints will arise and God will have the victory. So let's. Let's. Uh, bring up uh icon of our lady of fatima this is a devotion we've been trying to spread more is this this icon which is so this is a 
uh, the icon of Our Lady of Fatima, which is written by an Orthodox iconographer. This is Our Lady of Fatima in Slavonic. This is written in Slavonic. This is the Russian sacred, uh, sacred language in their liturgy. This is the icon of Our Lady of Fatima. And so we pray for the total conversion of Russia. We, we pray for peace in every way. Um, and we pray that the saints will arise and trusting ourselves to Our Lady of Fatima. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus is King.